It's no secret that writing can be lonely work, but does it really have to be? Whether you're full-time, part-time, or just starting out, you'll get insights into the tricks, tips, and production habits of writers from every level of the biz. From best-selling authors to those launching their first novels, you're sure to be in the company of friends as we encourage great writers to divulge and share their secrets. This is the Great Writer Share Podcast with your host, dark urban fantasy author, Holly Lyne. Hello and welcome to episode number 51 of the Great Writer Share podcast, a podcast where every week we hijack an hour or so of time from some of the kindest and hardest working writers around today to join us on the show and discuss everything that makes them tick, roar and bounce. My name's Holly Line and it's the 29th of August as of recording. Just in case you missed last week's announcement and are now horribly confused, the Great Writer Share team has expanded. I'm one of your new hosts. Myself, John Crinnan and Faye Trask have joined Daniel Wilcox to form a new supergroup of superb podcasters here on Great Writer Share. Every week, one of the four of us will be bringing you the same great interviews that you're accustomed to, just bringing a slightly different flavour to the show. I really hope you enjoy the changes. We're all super excited about this new era. So let's get into my personal update. Well, not to get too weird and meta on you in our very first outing together, but something rather significant has happened in my life this week. I'm recording my first episode for a new-to-me podcast. For those who don't know me, I've been co-hosting the Unstoppable Authors podcast with Angeline Trevina since April 2019, which has been a fantastic experience. And because I enjoy podcasting so, so much, I jumped at the opportunity to join Dan on this very podcast. It really is a cracking team that Dan has assembled and I'm thrilled to be part of it. In writing news, I'm currently working on my sixth novel, which is a new mini-series in my Shifters of Kerton universe. I write dark, gritty urban fantasy about shapeshifters, demons, and all that dark and dangerous stuff. This book is the much-anticipated return to fiction after taking a few months out to write my first non-fiction book. I've been cranking out some serious words this week in our Sprint channel on our Slack group for our patrons. I cannot emphasise enough how helpful I find it to write along with other people. It's a tasty bit of accountability and camaraderie that really helps the words to fly onto the page. So, our question of the week. A big thank you to everyone who answered the question of the week last week as posted on Patreon and Facebook. The question we asked was, where is the weirdest place you've been struck by an idea? We had some fantastic responses. Our very own Dan confessed to being inspired during sex, but the less said about that, the better. Yanni Jade said she gets inspired while out walking, including while exploring an abandoned mental hospital. I think that would get my creative juices flowing too, Yanni. John says he gets ideas in the shower, but also once he spotted some cool graffiti in Reykjavik, although it took him a decade to use that particular piece of inspiration. Ritu says in the middle of teaching when she can't write anything down. Jeff Adams described getting ideas on a bike ride from Boston to New York and scribbling notes on his phone during rest stops. Claire Littlemore says that she had an idea for a story while staring at a beautiful beach in Menorca. Meg Jolly was once inspired while exploring the Mexican jungle. That's different, and I can definitely see why that would be inspiring. And Andy says that it's always when he's least able to write anything down. I think we can probably all relate to that one. Thanks again to everyone who commented. You can get involved in the discussion on our Facebook group or on our Slack group for patrons. Today I'm going to be talking to fantasy author Autumn Burt. We discuss how often she's inspired by her long hikes in the mountains, how she once sold everything she owned in order to go travelling, and how she was able to maintain her writing career from her truck. It was a seriously inspiring interview that has got me hankering after the ability to travel the world. Before we get into the show, we wanted to remind you about our Patreon community over at www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get involved in our behind the scenes group, benefiting from early access, 
um, and ad-free episodes of the show and join our private Slack channel. You can also ask upcoming guests any of your questions and get involved in our monthly giveaway. So if you like the idea of upping your author career and getting all of that good stuff, then one more time, that's www.patreon.com forward slash great writers share. And now, without any further ado, let's dive into the interview with the one and only Autumn Burt. Today I have with me Autumn Burt. Autumn is an award-winning and best-selling author of almost 20 books. Her second epic fantasy series, Games of Fire, has received tremendous critical reviews, and book two, Gates of Fire and Earth, is also a Fantasia Reviews 2017 Book of the Year nominee and winner of Best World Building. She writes epic and dark fantasy with a bit of post-apocalyptic mayhem thrown in. Oh, and somehow a few non-fiction books have snuck into life as well, including stories of yurt living in Maine in the winter and real-life travel adventure with her husband, as well as writing help books co-written with her writing partner, Jesper Smith. She is also a graphic artist when not typing away or motorcycling, hiking, paddling, or chasing her small dog through the Vermont woods. That's a lot. <laughs> oh, as we were just saying before we started, yes, my life's a little busy and full and very varied, but yeah. I'm so glad I could be here. So thank you so much for asking me to join you today. Yeah, no problem. So do you want to start out by telling our listeners a bit about your writing journey? How did you come to be where you are now? Sure. And it's funny looking back. I mean, what is it? They say what hindsight is 2020. I Looking back in high school, I would write short stories all the time. I remember my brother once coming in. He was like, what are you doing? Because he was older than me and, you know, kind of like the cool boy in school, the troublemaker in the family <laughs> was, I was the goody two shoes. And I'm like, writing a short story. He's like, really? It's like, <laughs> you're doing this for fun. <laughs> you have to explain this to me. <laughs> but I had a story idea in my head and that was way back in high school. But yeah, I... I was always an artist. I was always drawing from my earliest memories. I was drawing. So I really thought that was my passion. I was good at it. So that's what I was doing. But even that, it didn't click. I did an English art degree and then went on to ecology and I got a job working in conservation, saving the world. It was very exciting. And it's very, it was excellent for learning world building. I must say, (laughs) perfect job. But it took me, I know the story stayed in my head and Oddly enough, it was a story that I'd written in the back. I had a tendency to write backwards in the back of school notebooks. So if I was bored during classes, I'd flip to the back and write in reverse. (laughs) And my husband found one of those and he started reading it. He's like, where did this come from? I'm like, oh, I was writing it in class because I was bored out of my mind. (laughs) And he's like, it's really good. You should keep writing it. And so that's actually part of, I wrote an entire trilogy that is unpublished and um, my mother loves it. <laughs> and otherwise, I tried to edit it once, and I think it broke every single writing rule within the first three pages. <laughs> so I kind of tossed it aside. And I started over with uh, what became Born of Water, and also my dystopian uh, series, Friends of My Enemy, and took two adult ed- ed- writing classes, a creative writing classes to get back into the flow of it, because at that point, I'd been, you know, out of school for like 20 years (laughs) and I just wanted to learn and it's funny it was early enough it was like 2010 when I was taking the courses Mm -hmm. they didn't even mention e-publishing that really hadn't kicked in especially where I was living in Maine which is sort of the edge of the universe in (laughs) as far as the United States go people honestly say Maine is that part of Canada (laughs) so (laughs) it's kind of like the forgotten state (laughs) so that's really how I got I just once it clicked, once I realized that this is serious, it's not, I love art. I still love drawing. I love drawing fantasy, like book covers, because mm-hmm. I realized what I love is telling a story. And so I like artwork that tells a story. And I, oh my God, I love the challenge of writing and especially long stories and bringing mm-hmm. characters and subplots and plots together. That is, I always, uh, I think I referred to it once. It's like you go from a V6 engine to like a V12. I mean, I just feel my brain power up and start spinning and running really well. And when I'm not writing, my mood is worse. I can't think as clear. It 
it's its own reward. And the fact that readers, you know, come back and like it, that I've won some awards, that's just, it's icing on the cake. It's fantastic. But I really do do it because I absolutely, it is what makes me want to live. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of relatable <laughs> stuff in yeah. there. It, that's what I love about authors. We have this similar passion in stories and almost like 99% of all authors are just amazing, wonderful people that I'm so glad we can be friends. Yeah, the community is really something special, isn't it? It really, it, I, I've compared it to some of the things my husband gets into with photography and other things. And people are kind of a jerk in the photography mm. realm. So I'm sorry if there's any photographers listening. If you're an yeah. author as well, I'm sure you're a fantastic person. But when it comes to <laughs> photography, they can be really like, this is slightly out of focus or there's like grain and they just rip each other apart. Mm. But authors, they're like hey, you have readers. I have readers. We like writing. Let's talk about it because we won't bore each other. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. Um, So you mentioned about cover design. That's another string to your bow. So yeah, yeah, tell me a little bit about how how that came about and what you love about it. Yeah. Oh, it's, I love the, again, I think I I crave challenges. I'm always, I do these pre-made covers just about every week. I admit I've missed last week, so I didn't do that one, but I do those. And I always think I should just do something easy and come up with this concept. You find a picture and it kind of generates almost a story idea in your head and you want to tell it in a picture. Mm -hmm. And I always end up doing something that takes way too much time, especially since, you know, these are not to anyone's books, so I don't know if they're going to sell. But I love learning new things with doing them. But yes, as I mentioned, I have a studio art degree. So I started drawing. Uh, f- it's a fine art degree from my undergraduate. So I started drawing. I think my earliest memories are literally are pencil and paper. I remember tracing. Um, I had briar horses and I remember tracing them on paper just to learn how to like really f- size a horse correctly. Mm. And that is, yeah, one of the earliest things I remember about my life. So it went from there to, you know, I put it aside for a while. I got a real job and um, especially in the United States, uh, recently did a podcast with Jesper and we talked about the, the perception of fantasy as a genre. And it's very similar to the perception of art in the United States where it's artsy fartsy, you know, people put it down. Mm. And so for a long time, I got a real job and made real money. And I put aside all the art stuff and it just felt like a zombie. Mm. It was not living. And I got back to it. And when I started writing and it generated, I'm like, I'm not going to, especially I published in 2012. So back then you could get away with anything (laughs) on Amazon. You could have a child's drawing as a cover and it would sell like hotcakes because there was like you know, a thousand books, it felt like. I mean, there was more than that, but there was less than a million books. Mm. Everything did well. It was fantastic. And so I started by making my own cover and doing my own map. And I started initially by hand drawing them Mm. and eventually moved into learning more about Photoshop because Photoshop didn't exist when I went to art school, which is really kind of embarrassing, (laughs) but it didn't even exist. So I have learned all my Photoshop skills since then, but Mm -hmm. that's been fun. And I absolutely adore it and it just moved from there so I was doing my own covers uh, and learning how to do them and just people were commenting on them and I finally started doing some commissions and then it really was about 2017 I went wide and started doing some pre-mades and some really like looking out for commissions and doing Mm -hmm. things like that yeah and it's it's the commissions are their own fun because you get to work with another author which is awesome because I love working especially with first-time authors because then you get to go through the experience of publishing for the first time again it's like (laughs) it's totally self-serving but it's really fun to be part of that journey for someone else yeah bit of living vicariously getting to really excitement again and again yeah it is you get the chills and the excitement and you know the the other you know so you're building off of each other and they're like showing me their books online I'm like yes (laughs) so it's so exciting (laughs) oh that's awesome so you mentioned Jesper there you guys have a podcast together and you collaborate Uh, so how did that collaboration come about Ah, oh, it was like asking someone for a blind date. <laughs> I was uh, traveling. I actually left my 
job, my day job in 2016 on my 30, 42nd, sorry, I wish it was 32nd, damn, <laughs> 42nd birthday, um, I actually quit my job and walked out the door. I gave him a two-week notice, but I did it so that I left on my birthday. Mm-hmm. And my husband and I, since we met before we were just dating, our dream was to travel and travel the world. And so we set off on a four-year road trip. <laughs> and at the time, right right about that time, I realized um, we were hiking on the Appalachian Trail. And I got, I was thinking of business plans. I hike and think of business plans, <laughs> which is a shame. But <laughs> I wondered if anyone had bought the URL Am Writing Fantasy. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm in the middle of like a five-day stint. There's so, Someone's bought it. No worries. No, that cannot still exist. Five days later, I got off the AT, I Googled it, and no one owned it. So I bought it. And Mm -hmm. so I own Am Writing Fantasy. And I started a blog and website and knew I wanted to do courses. I started building all this stuff. And it started doing well, which was fantastic. And it was, especially traveling full time, it was hard to do that initial business development without some help. And Jesper and I had run into each other on Twitter. He had a fantasy writing book. I knew he did the YouTube and I, again, I was hiking. I was hiking up in um, Pukawaska National Park in Canada, which is awesome. If anyone wants a really inspiring hike, go up to Pukawaska. And it's just it's North Shore Lake Superior and just stunning. Mm-hmm. And so there's a beautiful 10-mile hike there to go look at the suspension bridge. And we're walking back, and I thought, I knew I wanted to find someone to ask to see if they were interested in helping out. And I thought of Jesper. And so I, <laughs> all the way back, I formulated this, like, hi, I know we've barely talked and we just like helped you out with your book release, his fantasy map making book release. And do you want to team up and send it after I fig- you know, got back and wrote it? And I was thinking, oh, geez, this is just, he's going to think I'm cracked. He's like, it's an interesting idea to help you on the blog, but I have a bigger vision. And I'm like, okay, what? And so he actually sent me back a business plan. <laughs> <laughs> and since then, uh, this... October 1st will be three years that we've been building this together. Mm-hmm. So it's been a fantastic Germany. We complement each other. We agree almost on everything. And what's funny is he does not know how to build websites. He doesn't have the studio art side. But he does amazing spreadsheets and advertising, which I don't like doing at all. So we <laughs> complement each other very well. And it's been fantastic. Mm. Cool. So you have business ideas when you're hiking. Do you get story yes. ideas as well? <laughs> Absolutely. Isn't that like one of the best ways to overcome writer's block? I always, I feel like I, I always have one foot outside of the world I'm currently living in. Mm. I'm always thinking and the more I'm moving is definitely, you know, dishes, uh, shower. As soon as you have no way of writing something down, <laughs> your hands are messy. Absolutely the best idea ever will come into my head. <laughs> but it is definitely always something I refer to my mind as gears. There's always this gear spinning underneath everything. That is the writing gear. And even the business idea gear is definitely tied into that one somewhere. And it never stops. Even when I'm sleeping, I can find myself dreaming either. I can dream of my characters. I've finished my first trilogy and my uh, my characters would not leave me alone even though I wrote another series and I eventually had to come back and write a second trilogy just to make them shut up but unfortunately they're starting to talk to me again so we'll have to have a conversation at some point but it's they're always there I don't think I ever leave it and I know it can drive like significant others and family members a little insane because there's always this part of me that's detached Mm. but it's part of who I am I think Mm. two of my books got written while I was running on a treadmill oh excellent (laughs) I would zone out and you know see it playing in my head like a movie and then get home and type it up so it's fantastic something about moving your body I think that'd be almost better because then you don't have to worry about tripping over things or missing the bear that just ran by you know (laughs) it's horrible things like that Mm. Yeah, yeah I think moving your body does help get your mind flowing better Mm. that's fantastic so talk to me about this living in a yurt and (laughs) traveling and all of that fun stuff 
Yeah. So as I mentioned, uh, when I met my husband, Adam, we wanted to travel. We met on Martha's Vineyard, actually. And I remember this right. time, you know, we'd go out photog- you know, photographing and those were our dates and stuff. And we were on Oak Bluffs, which is very richy. It's very high class. And we we're walking behind this grandmother and her granddaughter and she looks down she's like I don't remember know if you remember darling but when we're on the Nile and I'm like oh my gosh I want to be able to say like so cavalier but then we were traveling on the Nile do you remember this thing <laughs> and it's just like and Adam was the same way we both wanted to travel and so we you know I was in school I was working in my master's program at the time so we finished that we did the career we got a house and we're trying to pay off bills, get rid of debt. And it's so, it takes such a long time. You start off as, you know, nothing with these student Mm -hmm. loans and it takes forever to just try to get your feet stabilized. So then of course you end up buying like a motorcycle or a snowmobile because we lived in Maine. So you end up spending money on things that for me, I would see them on the weekend. And then you have way too many hobbies to do on the weekend that you could never get anything done. Mm -hmm. So eventually we just said, this is ridiculous let's just get rid of it (laughs) all. So we sold our house. We, it was a gorgeous two car garage, a little 200 year old chestnut timber frame cave. It was adorable. A little Norman Rockwell cottage. And we basically just sold about 95% of everything we owned. And even that we, I think we limit down to like 98%. We still have some stuff in storage, a few favorite antiques and my cookbooks. I cannot get rid of cookbooks. I love (laughs) I love food. And uh, it took a lot of time, but the yurt was part of it because yurts are only about $12,000. It's 500 square feet, but you can put that up and live in it and not spend a lot of money. So we paid off everything and we moved into the yurt and that was going to be our we're going to hopefully travel from there, but it was really cold <laughs> in Maine. <laughs> As I mentioned, there was its own trials. And so that's where the book A Year and a Year came out of was, you know, how did this work? How did it work for paying off our debt? How did it work for changing, you know, take, as I think I put in the book somewhere, as you take the, when you realize the American dream of having your own house, the white picket fence, having the nice car, you realize it's killing your dream. And my dream was to be free and to go travel. Mm. And so, we nixed the American dream and just tried something different. And we had the yurt and eventually we, um, we decided the yurt was not the best base. So we built a small cabin up in Maine on some family property. And in the end, we started traveling. We still had that, but in the end we ended up selling that because of the location and getting back to it in time to take care of it. And just some other issues of the area, um, a house on the same road had been broken into and everything had been sold out of it. Mm-hmm. by the caretaker oh god um, so at some point you're like you know what it's easier just not to own anything and when we decide to stop again we'll just figure it out when we stop again so we were traveling all across north america we did a lot of canada as well dipped into mexico but not much um but mostly we like the northern states we like cold <laughs> and so we did that for four years in a land cruiser 80 if anyone knows it's a very classic vehicle not much room and we had a rooftop tent on top so a lot of our life was literally outside and i was still running my graphic design business um i i finished a map for an author while working at picnic tables <laughs> i finished my writing of the sixth book in my double trilogy um i think in montana in the passenger seat <laughs> so i uh at the moment we are sort of stationary partially because of the state of the world right now um Mm -hmm. at a free lease cabin that we helped build and we're kind of watching is our our job is to watch the property and take care of some cats and some odd things like that that we fell into right before the pandemic hit the united states Mm -hmm. so but it's been nice because i've been sitting still and really catching up on so many of the things that we have in our heads to get Mm -hmm. done so that's that's his benefit. I do miss the road. There's times I miss campgrounds so much. It hurts. Mm. There's something about that lifestyle. So uh, we've talked every once in a while, like, well, maybe if we got a van, I need something more comfortable that I can work inside, you know, when it's raining, Mm. other than the passenger size Mm -hmm. seat of this big SUV. Actually, it's not even that big, but it's definitely not fuel efficient. It's (laughs) it's what I look, it felt like a Mack truck, but then when you see it next to like a modern truck, you're like, oh my God, it's so tiny. How do we live in that? (laughs) 
Oh, so I mean, right now my cabin that I'm staying in is 200 square feet. So I've definitely learned to exist in small spaces. Mm. I would love more, but they say that about everything. You always need a little bit more room. (laughs) I think you expand to fill the space you have as well. Definitely. I think especially in the States where they're, you can rent these storages and you see people instead of cleaning out their cabinets, they just rent a bigger storage and <laughs> yeah. put more stuff in it and they never see the back of it. <laughs> so that's not, I do have a small storage. It's five square feet. So oh, that's stinky. <laughs> it's so small, but it's just what we need. You can stack some boxes and so like winter clothes can go there and the summer clothes and you know, like yeah. the books. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, we're currently clearing out uh, my husband's mother. Uh, she passed away last year. and oh, I'm so they've been... sorry. Oh, thank you. So we've been clearing out her house and she she had so much stuff and she had things of her mother's as well oh, from when wow. she passed away. So we have ended up renting a storage place just out of sheer necessity. Yes. We inherited all this stuff. So sometimes it's a good thing that's necessary. <laughs> It's a good thing they exist because, yes, there are times that it is just a wonderful thing to have, but Mm. uh, especially for family heirlooms, it doesn't run in my family, so Mm. it's not been a part of it. Other than, like I said, I have this massive piece of German furniture that my mom says she'll take back, but I'm afraid my aunt will get it if I do, so (laughs) I've kept it. (laughs) It's like six feet long and eight feet high. (laughs) I I had stored at my mother-in-law's just because I literally, when we built our cabin in Maine I had to design a wall it would fit against (laughs) but it also functions entirely as like a self-centered kitchen you know these things pull out these drawers and doors and so it's the most useful piece of massive furniture ever (laughs) but it's difficult to keep a hold of yeah yeah if you ever settle down somewhere bigger and more permanent then You've still got it. It's there. I do. It'll be my Insta kitchen, which as you can guess by my references to cookbooks and food, that is a big deal in my life. Hmm. So how do you, um, you know, how do you get your fix with your love of cooking while living on the road? That was hard. It was uh, was a mental challenge. And again, so I mentioned I like challenges. So you learn to figure out what you can make and what you can cook and what you can give up. And even when we moved into the yurt, I went from this huge farmhouse kitchen that was one of the biggest rooms in the house. And we, it had two L counters. So it's like you could have one for baking, one for cooking. It was so fantastic. And we went to 500 square feet, which is almost the size I could swear of that kitchen (laughs) and one long counter. And it's learning to like right now I've gotten ace at baking in Dutch ovens. There's a few <laughs> things you really can't do, but it is amazing what you can cook in a Dutch oven. Breads, um, brownies. I made zucchini brownies yesterday. Right now, zucchini is like zucchini and tomatoes are all we need to live on. <laughs> so I've learned to do brownies. And even when we had the yurt, I learned to use a grill. It makes a mm-hmm. very good oven. And so you start adapting. And even my husband, he is an amazing problem solver. So mm-hmm. between the two of us, if there's a will, there's a mental capacity to figure out a way to make it happen. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's be kind of our little challenge because we don't watch much TV. We don't have much other stuff to do. So our entertainment is basically problem solving our lives so that we can have the stuff that we still enjoy. Mm. Definitely good food is one of them. And so you just, we didn't use a lot of pre-made stuff. We had an ARB fridge, which is the ARB is an Australian company. They have road traveling across the desert expanses down. Uh So if you want to do this kind of thing, just check out what do they do in, you just Google, what do you do in Australia if you want to travel by road? (laughs) Or check out our book because I, uh, my husband and I did write a book on how to do this too. But that was the ARB fridge. I mean, those were the things that were a necessity for me. A two, good two-burner stove, uh, the Dutch oven, if when we could have it, cooking on open fire. And you just learn and every once in a while go out to eat. And usually I'm disappointed because I can cook it better over a campfire with like minimal tools. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned writing like in the passenger seat of your truck. And I mean, how do you fit in the words when... That's your lifestyle. <laughs> oh, I'm have to admit it has been so much easier now that I'm stationary because I'll write. In, my goal 
is over at least a thousand words a day. And I was for a while, I just finished up book one of a new trilogy where the novella is out. So I, towards the end was writing the climax. I actually hit like over 2000 words a day. And that was literally just like an hour in the morning and an hour right before bed. So just because I knew what I wanted to write, but when we were traveling, it was a lot harder. And that's why I would fit it in while on the road and my laptop perched on my lap as uh, Adam drove. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, it, what's really funny is I can't read in the car. I get car sick. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can write. <laughs> I can write because I can touch type. So I would literally be looking out the window and every once in a while just look at the screen (laughs) and be like, okay, good. And that way I didn't miss like the gazelles and the, just all the wildlife, wild goats, bison, all these things we'd be seeing by the Mm. road. I'd still be watching them for that kind of stuff, but I'd be reading, you know, typing the words in my head. Yeah. And it really, it comes down to making sure you have the plot. I'm, I'm not a strong plotter. I'm a hybrid pantser plotter. So I make sure I kind of know where I'm going and the characters, once the characters are alive in my head, as I mentioned, they will wake me up at night. They will talk to me. I, I, my husband and I've been together for 20 years. So he is totally used to me like having multiple things in my head and being like, so if you were a character stuck in this situation, you know, our conversations are often centered around fictional things in my head. <laughs> understanding so that's good yeah (laughs) it's useful having someone to brainstorm with absolutely when I wrote my dystopian post-apocalyptic dystopian and I was blowing things up I was constantly asking him if you were going to blow this and this up or (laughs) if this had happened and you had to escape what would you do so (laughs) my resource yeah when Google's not available, I ask my husband. <laughs> very handy. <laughs> yeah, very. That's why I keep him around. Then I have to cook for somebody, so you know, it works. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Um, so I presume one of the things you didn't get rid of was your motorbike. Oh, That's correct. Yeah. No, very true. Um, my 40th birthday, the year I turned 40, we had a lot of big things. I had my bucket list trip. We went to Peru and hiked the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu, which was like my no- number one bucket list thing I wanted to do since yeah. I was like 11 when I heard that there was hiking and that there was a trail to Machu Picchu. That was it. That is all I wanted to do. So we did that when I turned 40. We got a purple Mini Cooper. <laughs> that was really fun when I was 40. I was still working at the time. We could do this crazy stuff. And I bought myself a BMW F6 50 motorcycle so it's a dual sport can go on gravel roads because I love going up to Canada where no asphalt you know it's just dirt roads and no traffic for as far as you can see through Nova Scotia Mm. and uh, yeah it's in storage currently at my mother-in-law's they own a big kind of property they have a couple horses and so uh, it's in one of their empty horse stalls Mm. and every once in a while I go out there and I pet it when I go up (laughs) to Maine and see it um (laughs) So my husband still has his, uh, he has a KL- KLR 650. So they're both 650s. Mm-hmm. Totally different gearing though. We cannot go the same speed or <laughs> he's going bet- <laughs> the wrong gear and I'm going the wrong gear. But I really want to get back to it. When life is more stable, you need to have, uh, you need to have equipment and space to be able to tune it up or mm-hmm. the money to have someone tune it up and then take off again. But mm-hmm. I'm hoping in the next year or two to get her out of storage and, yeah. and live my rebel. You have to be a different mindset. You become like this character. You put on all the gear yeah. and the helmet. And especially I have a tin advisor so you can't see my face because I just prefer the an- anonymity of it. Yeah. And you become this like warrior persona. I'm like, get out of my way. <laughs> and it's a lot of fun. So whenever you're feeling timid in life, just get on a motorcycle and gun it and it feels fantastic very empowering i recommend it for everyone but take lessons first (laughs) yes yes (laughs) i love that i absolutely love that idea and i think writing gives us the ability to do that as well doesn't it take on another persona it does it allows us to take on another persona and i think uh like i wouldn't say i have control issues but i also know that i think i can handle being more out of control because I control people and worlds in my head. Things have to go the way I want them to. And no one can argue with me. I mean, they can try, but seriously, I can kill them off the next day. So I think writers, because we can take on other personas, we're more understanding, uh, we're more mm. calm. And actually, they've, there's been studies about readers because they live so many different lives that they are more empathetic. So scientific mm. studies for on readers, but not on writers. 
that it really does change your personality and who you are. And mm -hmm. I think maybe that's why we all get along. So we have that kind of like secret society where we can empathize with each other and we can, can control some things. And then, you know, we're actually co-writing right now with Jesper, which is a whole different experience to mm -hmm. create something with another person. Yeah. And again, you have to learn to collaborate, give and share in a different level than I think businesses can take on. I always joke that if I ever get to go to a presidential rally or something, get to ask one question, that question is going to be, what is your favorite book? Or what book did you read last? Because knowing what someone's reading and that they are a reader, to me, is a huge sign of if they're going to be a good leader. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> so um, I need to ask you mm -hmm. about uh, something else that's going on right now. Um, or will do when this airs, which is your yes. course launch. Yes, we are. I'm so excited. This is our premium premiere course, a writing course that's also a how to edit book marketing idea development author platform. I tried to design this as a one stop shop. As I mentioned, it's called the Ultimate Fantasy Writer's Guide. So it's tar targeting fantasy writers. But as I mentioned, I took these two. Uh, adult ed courses like novel writing 101 I think the other one one of the other ones was creative writing and they were pretty horrible <laughs> which is so bad to say but a lot of them consisted of getting handouts and then having people critique each other who these were critique you know they didn't even know any the basics about how to write well but we were asked to critique and it became almost a personality contest like most people were writing memoirs and I could use one adverb or adjective and they'd rip me apart. And then someone else would use the exact same one. They'd be like, oh, that was wonderful. And I was like, what? What? <laughs> and if you haven't noticed, I guess it's one of the big secrets of my life is that stuff like that, injustices, burn me to the deepest mm. level. And I would start, I would just go online and I would start ripping, like looking for the answers because they were obviously not giving them to me. Mm -hmm. And so I started blogging and creating all this information that was out there. And I'm like, finally decided, you know what? I'm putting it into a course. And so that became the ultimate fantasy writer's guide. And so I wanted it to be, I'd taken, you know, you can go, especially at the time, there was so little information out there. This is Oh gosh, fourth, fifth, I don't remember how many years we've had this out now. <laughs> it's just horrible. I think it's third or fourth year. But it's um, it was one of those at the time, there wasn't much information. Now there's too much information, but it's almost always like you have to buy this course or that course and this course. I'm like, no, one-stop shop, just the essence, not the stuff that was like from high school that makes you go brain dead mm. and you gotta like go to snooze. What you need to do, what you need to learn to write well, to develop characters well, to world build well, and get straight into writing and to carry through all the steps of writing a solid, really good novel. And then really... What does it take to edit it? What does it take to get a cover? What does it take to actually publish it? There is a um, template in there for publishing. And so all of those aspects, and then even how to take it to market, how to publish it to fans, how to build an author platform. So I wanted it all there. I always bite off more than I can chew. Uh, I jokingly say I live my life as an experiment so other people know if it works or if it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this worked and it's been fantastic the students love it we do monthly q a sessions there's some really cool bonuses in there mm -hmm. and the big announcement which is only i think it's only just coming to light so when this airs the course is open for enrollment we only do this every six months we actually dropped the price by a hundred dollars so it used to be 597 it's now only 497 and we did that because the world's crazy authors are awesome we want to help as many as we can mm -hmm. so we thought this would help lower that bar of getting in mm -hmm. and ah, so we did <laughs> we actually dropped the price which really I didn't think we'd ever do so I'm really excited uh, we'll see how it goes mm -hmm. and yeah I'm it's like I said it's only open till September 7th and then it'll be a six-month wait and it's amazing. You can, six months, I can write a whole trilogy. So don't wait too long. <laughs> <laughs> For listeners who may be tuning in after enrollment closes, is there like a wait list or is it just yeah. to keep an eye out? 
There is a wait list you can join by following the same link and you go to click the buy and you can get right into the wait list. Or we also have a, the Ultimate Fantasy Writer Starter Kit, which is a three f- video series that's free. Mm-hmm. And so we, I'll give you the link so you can post that below this as well. Yeah. And so that is there all the time. And once you get on that, we will let you know when the course actually opens as well but it's full of some really useful tips some novice mistakes that will keep you from finishing writing and some tools that'll help make sure you succeed as well as an initial video on idea development excellent wow that sounds fantastic um so you kind of answered this a little bit at the beginning but I want to give you another chance maybe to nail in um we ask all of the guests on great writer share why do you write Wow. So that's, yes, I write because I want to create sort of the stories that inspired me, I think, as a child. That's why I started writing. When I was in high school, um, it was the era of Dungeons and Dragons where they were the evil. And oh my goodness, you should never read them. If it wasn't for my one high school friend, I never would have read them because my mom would have outlawed them. And I don't think the library even carried them in my town. But it wasn't just Mercedes Lackey. um, And and McCaffrey. I mean, just so many authors and writers, and they opened up a whole world for me in this small town, Pennsylvania, very conservative town, and taught me to see the world through a different lens. And that's what I love about fantasy is that you can take concepts that are so touchy in our world and turn them into a fantasy story and open up someone's mind that they didn't even realize that there's another way of looking at it. You can leave some prejudices behind. Mm -hmm. You can be more understanding, more empathetic, like we mentioned. So definitely knowing how the stories I read made me into the person I am, which I hope is, you know, a kind person, at least a nice person. I want to be able to pay that forward to a whole new generation. Mm -hmm. And like I mentioned, I, even if there was no internet, the whole world did end tomorrow, except for some, I was still there and I had some pieces of paper. I would still write because I love who I am. I'm a happier person when I'm writing. So I would keep it up just for that because I'm sure I could go tell the squirrels a few stories or two. <laughs> My dog loves them, you know. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have come to the moment that every guest um, is thrilled about. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say dread, that's a good sign. <laughs> I nearly did. I nearly did. I stopped myself. Uh, no, it's the quick fire round. Okay. So, ten questions. Answer as quickly as you can. Don't overthink. Okay. You ready? All right, let's go. Favorite color? Blue. Favorite singer or band? How about favorite song? It's called Polignale e Tudora by the Belgian, Bulgarian acapella group. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, Socks or bare feet? Bare feet. The last book that made you laugh? Oh, geez. I think the one I'm writing, can I cheat? <laughs> yeah, no, you're in book. It's okay. Fine. All right, yes. So it'll be called Faye, uh, Faye Revolution. Okay. <laughs> uh, this may be an obvious answer, given what I now know about your life, but do you burn candles? Yes. Oh, you do? Hey! Yeah, I do. Uh, cinema or movie at home? Movie at home. Do you cry easily? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay who would win with 24 hours prep time batman or kevin from home alone i'm going for kevin <laughs> <laughs> me too okay <laughs> comedy or drama darn it depends on my mood i was gonna say if it's romantic comedy i'd ro- rather have drama but sometimes you just need a good laugh if it's shrek comedy <laughs> <laughs> okay and favorite fantasy trope oh that would be oh shoot i just covered this with jesper it should come right to me we just did a whole episode on tropes i would say it is the heart the twist when everything seems to be going one way and almost like with um game of thrones where you know you expect things to go one way and he ends up losing his head i just love something that comes out of left field Mm -hmm. it's not really a trope it kind of turning all the tropes on their head but Mm. yeah i think i think the plot twist is a solid trope okay okay that's 10 questions well done thank you 
So one final question, where can our listeners find out all about you, your books, your podcast and your course? Oh gosh, well, they're going to send you all over the internet. No. <laughs> find out about me. My writing web- website with all my books is autumnwriting.com easy enough and all of the courses you can find all the information about the podcast uh we actually used to have a youtube channel we still promote to youtube but now it's kind of static but all of that is on amwritingfantasy.com brilliant thank you very much autumn it's been wonderful to chat to you oh it's been fantastic holly thank you so much for having me on you're welcome A huge thank you to Autumn for donating her time. You can find out more details about the Ultimate Fantasy Writer's Guide course via the link in our show notes. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Great Writer's Share podcast. Tune in next week when John will be interviewing V. Castro. Don't forget, you can catch up on our entire backlist of episodes, plus get all of the backstage access, our Slack channel, and even one-to-one coaching from Dan by joining our Patreon from as little as $1 a month. Find out more at www.patreon.com forward slash Share. Until next time.